The following episode contains graphic imagery that may not be suitable for children. Also, check out our new fantasy podcast, The Endless Ocean. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. The following episode is the second half of a two-parter. If you have not listened to Animals Part 1, then please go back and give it a listen. Don't worry, we'll be here when you get back. And now, Episode 6 of Season 2, Animals Part 2. I first heard of Jesse Dominski in an article released by the Denver Post last February. In the article, Jesse is mentioned only once. Quote, Our anonymous source summarizes that considering which body parts are missing and the number of corpses found, it is highly likely that the killer is in fact a member of the Rocky Mountain Border Patrol. It could be any number of the brutish members of control, the veterinarian on staff, Jesse Dominski, or even the decorated war hero, Calvin Cranston. All are suspects. All are liable. End quote. The majority of the article was focused on the Skinner, the unimaginative name given to the culprit of these killings. The article garnered international attention, sweeping over North America as only a gruesome, unanswered mystery can. Theories abounded, naming anyone mentioned in the article as a potential killer. However, almost none found interest in the diminutive veterinarian, choosing instead to focus on the muscle-bound control, or her quiet assistant. Now, Jessie occupies every headline. She fills every theory with speculation, many researching her life story to find something, anything juicy enough to extend this horrifying story. The following episode does not concern itself with theory, conjecture, or wishful thinking. The following story is, from Jesse's own words, true. The third body was much like the first two. Skinned, valuable parts cut clean, found at night. There was, however, one lone exception. The cuts were cleaner, more professional. Control was learning. I thought, they'll get a better price for undamaged material. They are creating their own little poaching empire, right under my nose. The thought ingrained itself in my brain. Dark waves of depression crashed down upon me, pulling me into their depths. I woke most nights unable to breathe. I was helpless, totally and completely. I had promised to find my sister promised to protect her, but for all I knew she was lying on my table right now, without eyes or teeth or fur to keep her warm. For all I knew she was dead already, killed by the very men I worked with. It didn't help that I could no longer do my job. With two fingers missing, it was impossible to hold a scalpel with my dominant hand. And when the fourth and fifth bodies appeared, my job was quickly shifting from veterinarian to coroner. I had to rely on Benji more and more, instructing him where to cut, what to look for, standing over his shoulder. Backseat surgery. I felt ridiculous, impotent, helpless. But there was nothing for it. Nothing at all. So I did what all rage-fueled, powerless people do. I wrote a strongly worded letter. I believe now it's called my manifesto, but at the time, it was simply this, an angry letter to Art Cheney, my boss, stating that whatever they have become, anatropes were once human beings, and they should have the same rights now as they did then. Anatrope hunting was akin to murder. Anatrope poachers were psychotic serial killers who should be treated with all the mercilessness of our present day prison system. Years ago, the government of the Rockies instituted a zero-strikes policy in prisons, allowing guards to use lethal force on any prisoners they deemed 
too dangerous for captivity. As inhumane as this law sounds, it passed unanimously. When prisoners are stronger than the walls that cage them, the only thing keeping them in check is fear. Fear that if they step out of line, they are lawfully allowed to be put down. Sometimes, an animal just has to die. This is the fate I wished for those who hunted anatropes for sport or profit. I am aware of the irony. I wrote with a self-righteous fury that grew with each passing word. The law states murder can only be committed by a human unto another human, and anatropes by law are not human. I ignored this fact, even going so far as to bluntly state my suspicions about control running their own illegal poaching ring. I tattled on them. It was all I had left. I should have known it wouldn't work. I should have known that my superiors saw me the same way Cranston and his cronies did. I was the mad, liberal, anatrope-loving woman with ideas far above her pay grade. It was, in the end, easy for them to ignore me. I never got a response to my letter, or at least not from my superiors. Control, however, made their feelings abundantly clear. Benji was shoved into a wall on his way to our lab. The tires to my Volvo were slashed, and the latest anatrope body was delivered with so little care it was too damaged to perform a proper autopsy. Enough was enough. After disposing of the corpse, I stormed into Cranston's office. The old man's face gave nothing away. Not a hair on that pristine mustache quivered as I yelled, condemning the lack of professionalism from his men. He nodded calmly. He was enjoying it, I thought. He liked being the calm, composed man to my raving, hysterical woman. He liked it. Damn him. I will speak to them, he promised, and showed me the door. I left his office feeling even more an idiot than before. He was in on it. Those thugs did nothing without the okay of their boss. And who did they hear about the letter from anyway? It all came back to Cranston. All of it. The bodies, the bullying, everything. I should have known Cheney would show Cranston the letter. They played golf together every weekend, had work barbecues that Benji and I never seemed to be invited to. It was all so obvious in retrospect. Everything was obvious in retrospect. But the bullying stopped. In fact, any interaction with Control simply ceased. We were no longer phoned in the middle of the night for cleanup. Instead, they would drop the carefully packaged bodies off in the morning. They did not speak to Benji or me. They were silent, respectful. A few months before, I would have given anything for this kind of treatment. But by then, I hated it. It made me feel like a child. But a toxic workplace environment was the least of my worries. Bodies were still piling up. Over the course of six months, we found eight anatrope bodies, each butchered cleanly, professionally, brutally. That made 12 overall. I believe the proper term is a killing spree. I once again went to my superiors. It's control, I screamed in their face. Why couldn't they see it? They once again ignored me. So I leaked it. Yes, I was the one who leaked the story. I saw no other option. Nothing was being done. And I knew, I hoped to get the public on my side. I knew a reporter, barely. Back in elementary school, I used to bully a girl named Idina Mobley. The boy I liked had a crush on her, and I was looking for someone to be cruel to, and Idina was the obvious choice. As we grew up, hit puberty, and went to high school, I always had a vicious word for her, a snide remark to cut her down. 
I have no excuses for it, except that I was a teenager and, and that I am very sorry for it now. That was what I told Adina when I called her. She works for the Denver Post. She didn't forgive me, but she did take the story. I suppose it was the best I could hope for. The article came out on a Monday morning. By Wednesday, the protesters had found their way to HQ. They surrounded the building, setting up tents, constructing signs, and shouting poorly composed chants whose priority sacrificed coherence for rhyme schemes. I loved it. This was the attention I was looking for. I felt vindicated, powerful, and perhaps most importantly, not alone. Other people cared about anatropes. There was a movement. We could change legislation. It seemed, however briefly, that all those poor creatures wouldn't die in vain. The fact that most of the protesters were missing the entire point didn't matter. They had gathered not to obtain rights for anatropes, but to protest animal cruelty. Show a picture of a man lying dead in the street, and people will turn the page. Replace the man with a dead dog, and that same person is on the phone complaining. But it didn't matter. They were chanting for reform. Cranston was backed into a corner, spending all his time policing the protests, and none of it hunting anatropes. I had won. At least I thought I had. But then another body appeared. No, that's not right. Not really a body. In fact, it wasn't a body at all. Benji found it. He was driving into work early when he saw it. A river of blood pushing itself across the pavement. We were called in immediately, forcing our way past the throngs of protesters to our vehicles. What we found was like nothing we had seen before. It was, I'm sure the murderer would describe it as art. Bones had been fastened together with what looked like a hot glue gun to form a white pedestal about four feet high. They were without a doubt anatrope bones. You could see the stretch marks from their transformation. And sitting at its summit sat a dripping, perfectly removed heart. The rest was gone. They had taken all of it. I saw Cranston trembling, his knuckles white. Another man would have turned on me, would have shouted, but not him. Say what you want about Calvin Cranston, he is a man under control. I moved past him to inspect the heart. It was pristine, removed with the confident, accurate cuts of a professional. The lack of tearing indicated sharp, well-cared-for instruments. I remembered the first body, how each cut had been crude, vicious, and done with a blunt instrument. It appeared our killer was learning. And then I knew. I couldn't breathe. My heart pounded in my ears. My hands trembled. Slowly I rose and walked back to the fuming director of control. Cranston, I said, a word. We returned to his office. I told him my suspicions. For a long moment, Cranston looked at me, a deep, abiding hatred nestled behind his eyes. Then finally he spoke. Did you leak the story, Miss Deminsky? He asked. My words died in my throat, leaving nothing but a silence between us. Cranston nodded his understanding and said, Please leave my office. And I did. I have the rest of my life to think about what would have changed if I had stayed. But in the moment, I knew it was hopeless. I knew I was on my own. That night, I left HQ at my usual time. 
waiting until nightfall for the protesters to either go home or lose energy. I hoisted myself into my Volvo and drove off. Only I didn't go home. I circled around the building, hiding my car behind the dumpsters in the back. I then made my way for the trees and waited. And waited. It wasn't until nearly midnight that the light to our laboratory was switched off and Benji, good sweet Benji, exited the building. He was carrying two bags with him. One was his normal backpack, containing a computer, several comic books, and his lunch. The second was thin, rectangular, and very familiar. I caught my breath. The bag belonged to me. He opened his car door, threw his backpack in, and closed it. Then, without so much as checking if he was alone, Benji turned, clicked on a flashlight, and walked into the woods, not 20 feet from where I was hidden. Slowly, steadily, I followed him into the darkness. Benji moved through the trees, never stopping to check where he was or where he was going. He knew every step. He had traveled this path many times before. I did not have this luxury, and was certain Benji would hear me stumbling through the brush behind him. But he never did. And only when I stumbled dangerously close did I see why. He had his earbuds in. He was listening to music. The overconfident ass, I remember thinking. He thinks he's untouchable. But just then he switched his light off, plunging me into absolute darkness. I stopped, twisting desperately, hoping, praying for some source of light. But the moon had waned, and clouds filled the sky. We were far from base, far from anything or anyone that could save me. A hand shot out of the darkness, grabbing me by the shoulder. I turned, ready to strike, but a numbness streaked up my arm, deadening it. Useless, it fell to my side. I stumbled away, pins and needles overpowering any commands I sent to my arm. I didn't understand. Benji was supposed to be powerless. But if that were true, then how had he killed so many anatropes? Do you like it? His voice emerged from the darkness. I've worked very hard to hide it from you. And then there he was, emerging from the night, his face shining white with sweat, his eyes finally meeting mine. I had never noticed how empty they were, not until they were pointed at me. Anesthetic? I asked, trying to keep my panic from boiling over. Benji nodded. Useful in our profession, don't you think? I only cut them when they're dead, I responded. Benji looked at his hand with lazy adoration. Yes. And in the beginning, I thought that would be enough for me, too. Understanding them. Seeing them bleed. But it wasn't enough. Not ever. He looked up at me as if remembering I was there. I'm sad to see you here, Dr. Dominsky. You don't deserve this. I took a step back from him, but then stopped myself. He had the light. He had the power. He had my bag. If I ran, he would catch me. If I fought, he would kill me. I knew which option I preferred. I charged him, swinging my good arm toward his face. But he sidestepped me with cloying ease, slipping a hand under my shirt to touch his skin to mine. And then he was behind me, a numbness spread down into my legs, collapsing my body to the ground. I gave out a scream but stopped myself. I would not scream for him. I would not let him enjoy this. But as Benji stood over me, he looked anything but happy. I could see tears in his eyes and he turned his head away to hide them. 
I'm sorry, he said. I have to do this. You have always been good to me. With my last working limb, I began to drag myself away from him. But when his hand fell on my shoulder, gentle and caring, the numbness spread. His voice whispered in my ear, hot and acrid. Don't worry. I'll make sure it won't hurt. I know just where to cut you. Just like you taught me. Then he knelt down next to my soon-to-be corpse, laying my leather briefcase on the ground. With a sigh, he unzipped the case, flipping it open to reveal my surgery equipment. Scalpels, saws, chest clamps, every instrument a psychopath would ever need. And I had given them to him and taught him how to use them. I could taste bile in my throat, but Benji was still talking. You know, we're the same. I knew it when you told me about your sister. Killing your father like that. Ripping out the throat of the man who raised her. Loved her. I wanted to tell you then. I wanted you to know I understood. He paused, taking a breath, and then continued. It was my father. A monster even before a B-Day. That's why... When he changed, I knew he hadn't changed at all. He was as he always was. Only now the world could see it too. They're all like that. All these monsters you care so much about. Your sister, my father, all of them. Becca just exposed them. Made the monsters real. So they could be exterminated. He trailed off. His frantic voice sounded almost like a child. A child wanting a parent to say he'd done well. Is that why you killed them? I managed to say. Because you're a hero? I knew you wouldn't understand, he snapped back. No one understands. I laughed. It erupted through my numbed chest, tearing at my throat as it passed. Terror and hatred had robbed me of speech. I wanted to hurt him, and petty, derisive laughter was the last weapon left to me. Benji set his jaw. His eyes receded back into his head. He looked down at the ground. Yes, that was the Benji I knew. Scared, unsure, unable to meet my eyes. When he spoke, Gone was the confident killer. In his place was the bumbling, stuttering assistant I had relied on for so long. I wish you hadn't followed me. Why didn't you go home? I've never killed a human before. I don't want to start. I... I... I'm... His voice faltered. Tears streamed down his face. He was shaking all over as he raised a scalpel to my throat. I'm afraid I'll like it. Then Benji's shoulder exploded in a spray of blood. He screamed, dropping the scalpel into the dirt next to me. Two large figures charged out of the forest, football tackling him to the ground. Benji struggled. His good arm flashed upward, grabbing the neck of one of his assailants. The big man tensed, then collapsed on top of Benji, pinning the kid to the ground. Benji screamed and cried, but the giant man from control didn't move. He couldn't move. Benji had seen to that. He was trapped. I let out a breath. Are you all right? A deep, gravelly voice said, as strong, wrinkled hands gently grabbed hold of me and lifted me into a sitting position. Cranston knelt there, his eyes holding me steady as much as his hands. I felt like crying, but the long habit of not showing weakness in front of this man stopped me. I nodded slowly and rested my head against his shoulder. It was over, I thought. It was over. The next two hours were a blur. More men from Control appeared up with ATVs, lights, and guns. Benji was handcuffed to a tree, his bullet wound tended by Cranston's medic. Benji was raving, 
screaming threats at anyone who came close, spittle frothing from his mouth, his eyes contorting and spasming every which way. I watched as the feeling slowly crept back into my limbs. It wasn't until Cranston returned that I realized he had been missing. He began a hasty, tense conversation with one of his lieutenants, all the while glancing backwards into the dark woods from where he had come. There was something about Cranston that unnerved me. Cranston, for the first time since I'd known him, was afraid. Feeling had returned to my legs, and I rose, looking to question the control director. But before I could reach him, Cranston called several men to join him and moved back into the forest, stopping just long enough to tell me to stay put. I did as I was told. The man had just saved my life, after all. What? A voice hissed behind me. Don't you want to see it? I turned. Benji sat hunched over, bound to a tree, his hair falling across a face contorted by a demented smile. I looked back into the woods, then back to Benji, then back to the woods. Go on, Benji whispered. I couldn't help myself. I walked into the unending darkness of the forest. The walk didn't take long. I could see the lights of control up ahead. They seemed to illuminate the side of a cliff. But as I drew closer, I saw them lead into a cave. I stopped. Every sense I possessed screamed at me not to enter the cave. Somehow I knew that whatever was inside would mark me forever. But I had to know. I had to know what was in there. I had to know if she was in there. I stepped into the light and immediately wished I hadn't. The cave was small, just a bit larger than my one-room apartment, but it was filled, filled with Benji's trophies. Pelts lined the wall and the ground each one a different color, each one expertly cut from their owner's flesh, skulls hanging from wires slowly turned in midair, each one a different shape, each one freshly scoured of all that made them living. Off in the corner was what looked like a miniature of a city. Five-foot skyscrapers rose out of the ground, complete with cars and tiny figures marking the roads. But as I drew closer, I saw that this makeshift toy was made from teeth. I felt sick. A greasy, pleasant smell reached my nostrils and I looked down to find a fire pit with a half-eaten leg of meat still hanging from the spit. The meat looked like it had been cooked several days ago and was beginning to attract flies. Cranston looked up just in time to see me stumble away. He chased me out of the cave, catching up only as I fell to the ground to heave up what little remained in my stomach. The images burned themselves in my brain. I closed my eyes to them, but they burned brighter in the darkness. I could see it all. I will always see it all. Even now, I can picture everything in that cave perfectly. Every pelt, every skull, every tooth, everything. But still, even in these last moments left to me, I can't tell if any of them were her. I just can't tell. Granston was kneeling beside me, his words blending together into a soft buzz, floating skulls. I let him pull me to a standing position and lead me back into the clearing where Benji waited. Skinned pelts. He said something and moved off. I swayed without his support. My vision flickered in and out, blurring, trying to take me away from the darkness. A city of teeth. I let it take me. I wanted to escape, wanted to be free, 
wanted this to have never happened. Did you find her? His voice cut through the haze, snapping the world back into clear, pristine focus. There he sat, a smile distorting his face beyond reason, his shoulder a bloody, pulpy mess, his eyes wide and fevered. He looked like the bird from my dreams. I stepped towards him. He was speaking, but I couldn't hear him, wouldn't hear him. His words fell off me. He could no longer hurt me. He could no longer hurt anyone. He was an animal, a wounded, hurt, sick animal. And some animals you just couldn't save. Some animals had just one option left. I edged forward as I have many times before, speaking words I don't remember, letting the sound of my voice hide my frantic heart. I moved slowly. I spoke softly. I knelt. Benji jerked away against his bindings, but he could not escape me. I slid one hand behind his trembling neck and pushed his head forward to rest on my shoulder. He was shaking. Did he know what I was about to do? I'm not sure. Another question I will never know the answer to. I suppose it doesn't matter. I raised the scalpel he had dropped and gently, calmly, slid it across his throat. I felt him go rigid and then relax as blood spilled onto my lap. I heard men scream and pull me from Benji. I was pressed into the ground. My hands were bound behind me. I was carried into a jeep and taken back to headquarters. I was questioned by control. I was questioned by Cranston. I was questioned by police. I was questioned by a lawyer. I was condemned by a jury. I accepted it. I pleaded guilty. I murdered Benji. I killed a human being, and for that, in this world, I am sentenced to die. I often wonder what would have happened if I had let Benji live. How would the jury have treated him? He wasn't a murderer, after all. He said it himself. He had never killed a human. They would have let him go. It's the one solace I have, as I wait for the guard to come fetch me. It's mere minutes away now. He'll open the door and lead me to a room with a chair in it, and then it will end. Look at that, Benji. You killed me after all. In these last months of solitude, I have had ample time to think about that walk, about that chair. I expected to cry to tear my hair from my scalp, to plead for my life. I expected to despair. But it's a funny thing. Now it's upon me, all I feel in this moment is thankful. Not thankful to Cranston for saving me, or thankful to my supporters who missed the point entirely. I'm thankful to Benji. Yeah, that's right. Poor, sadistic Benji, whose life I cut short with a scalpel. I am thankful to him, because even now when I think back on that cave, through all the pelts, bones, and meat, there was nothing I could recognize as my sister. Nothing that told me without a doubt that she was dead, butchered like the animal so many of you still believe her to be. There was nothing, which in these final moments means everything. It means that she could still be out there, still be running with her pack, still be howling at the moon. It means that maybe, just maybe, I didn't fail her. It is a small hope. 
But in these final moments, it's all I have. This has been a production of the Fool's Gallery Podcast Network. Animals was written and directed by Keenan Ellis and performed by Elizabeth Seeley. Background sound composed by Sword Coast Soundscapes. And once again, subscribe to our new fantasy podcast, The Endless Ocean, which follows the ship, the Alabaster Queen, as it sails into an unexplored, haunted, and dangerous ocean. The crew of the Queen will travel beyond the edge of the world, where gods, humans, and creatures of unknown magic and origin vie for survival on the tide.